Fundamentals of Mixing, lesson number seven in the premix uh, preparation category. We've got monitoring and self-calibration. So we just went over the speaker configurations and all this sort of stuff. And I want to go over um, a couple of other things here that are maybe, um, you know, not so obvious. But you have to understand not only how your speakers work, but how you work. Uh, one of the things that is important to really understand about um, our particular hearing is that it's not consistently the same. Like uh, people have their hearing tested, and it's actually a very good idea, as much as you might be afraid to do a frequency analysis of your left and right ear. Uh, never do it in a convention. <laughs> um, you know, do it with a um, an eye, ear, nose, throat doctor. Um, do a full frequency analysis um, and find out, you know, find out ahead of time if they will do that. That, you know, tell them that you're an audio professional and that, you know, this is this is the frequency response uh, assessment is critical to it. So this is not about getting hearing aids or something, which is what a lot of the doctors do. So um, uh, you can also contact uh, there. If you look on the website and search for hearing loss, uh, then you will you will usually find resources that allow you to connect to somebody who uh, is maybe more audio friendly for things like that um, and doctors and stuff like that. So uh, do it right if you're going to do it on, on that side of things. It's important to know what your hearing capabilities are and if there are deficiencies left and right, what they are, uh, a little more specifically. The thing, though, is that if you... Um, you know, if you did that and you just went out and had this huge pancake breakfast before going in to do the test, you may find that your high frequencies show up more poorly on the test uh, than they do if you uh, went in and you had a fruit salad that morning before going into the doctor's office. Uh, what you eat, um, how much sleep you've gotten, uh, you know, or how well rested you are, how generally fatigued you are, um, uh, different times of the day. Um, humidity, all kinds of things, uh, mood, affect your hearing capabilities. So it's something that morphs. It's not something that's fixed or always the same. And it's important to really understand that, that our hearing is is not fixed, that it's this flexible, morphable thing. So what happens is, is there are certain things, I'm not going to bore you with all the numbers because there's plenty of stuff, but one thing I want to talk about is something called temporary threshold shift. Um, temporary threshold shift, if you look it up online, is a designation for hearing loss or temporary hearing loss. So something loud, uh, firecracker, something blows up uh, nearby your head, and then all of a sudden the hearing on that ear all of a sudden gets dulled. It's your brain or your body's way of protecting itself. So the mechanism actually clamps down, shuts down the mechanism because there is something environmentally that's going on that is going to harm the uh, body. So just like if somebody's throwing a punch at you, you you will uh, tighten up or you will clinch up, you know, as a way of protecting yourself or you will move in a, in a defensive way just naturally, right? Uh, it's not a conscious thing. And so your brain does the same thing and it clamps down in your hearing. And then usually what occurs afterwards, you get a loud ringing in your ear afterwards, just a little warning sign uh, that some things are wrong. Um, we've all had um, things where we go to a club and our hearing is um, dulled because we're at a club, it's loud, and then you go outside and you realize that you're still screaming at your friends when you're talking to them, even though you're outside the club and there's no more loud music. <laughs> and probably one of the worst things that can happen is if you if you listen, you know, you want to obviously protect your hearing, you put in earplugs in a club. Ideally, you want vented earplugs. Uh, so that it maintains, um, you know, a, a better balance of higher frequencies. Uh, because if you put plugs in that are really seal the ears, what ends up happening is that you get a more dB uh, gain reduction, but also it really cuts down on high frequencies. And what happens is your brain compensates for that. Your brain is always morphing around its environment to make it more intelligible. So when loud sounds occur, it shuts down the mechanism. When everything is soft and quiet, it makes the mechanism more sensitive. So if you hear sound um, in, you know, like you wake up in the middle of the night and, and there's a sound, it sounds like it's just this crushingly loud sound and it's just like a beeping from your fire alarm, you know, like three rooms away with your door closed and everything. And you realize it's like, that's not really that loud. Like if that happened in the same situation at four o'clock in the afternoon, 
it would be like, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, is that the fire alarm? But when you're asleep, your hearing is ultra sensitive in that in that way, or it can be, uh, because you're rested. And so the sensitivity changes based on the environment. If you listen to speakers and you first sit down, the speakers sound really bright, you'll notice that 20 minutes later, if you continue listening, they won't sound bright anymore. Your brain will kind of balance out. It'll try to intelligent. So what you have essentially with the total threshold system uh, built in is a dynamic equalization circuit. Um, and it's fun when you have dynamic EQs. We love dynamic EQs. But um, it's more fun when you have control over all the settings. And so you don't have control over all the settings. They're sort of hidden away in um, an infinitely complex uh, set of neural transmissions, you know, um, uh, uh, electrochemical signals that are bouncing around through your brain that are giving instructions about how your hearing mechanism works, right? And uh, so the way that um, all of this ends up uh, playing out is that you have to be very conscious of how you're listening that particular day or how you're hearing that particular day. You also need to keep your monitoring volume at decent levels. It's one thing, and it's important, you know, uh, to hear music at louder volumes. So I'm not one to say you like always listen at 65 dB SPL or anything like that. Um, there are actual stress systems. They, the, um, there are agencies here in the United States and Europe and, and uh, countries that set uh, loudness standards for sound. So someone working on an airport runway has to wear these earmuffs or these things that block out sound because otherwise they would go deaf uh, as the jet engines were taking off and planes were going you know, back and forth and coming in and out. So there are protection mechanisms that are built in to preserve their hearing. Uh, all industrial environments have these restrictions, and so maybe there needs to be hearing protection, and it is all these standards. One of the reasons why 85 dB SPL or uh, uh, somewhere in that range is considered sort of a, a, um, um, a kind of mark for where you go listening-wise, uh, two reasons. One, the Fletcher-Munson curve. So on the Fletcher-Munson curves, um, the uh, curves are more or less kind of flat. Right, so overall the frequency response has a tendency to be flat. Also, um, it's a fairly reasonable level, so you can actually listen um, for eight hours at that level before um, experiencing any kind of uh, fatigue. Now, I think you actually fatigue more at that listening volume than what they're doing, but it's not subject to hearing loss. In other words, your brain will morph around whatever it's hearing at 85 dB SPL, you're not getting hearing loss as a result, but your brain is adapting to what it is that you're hearing. So you've experienced all of this, and I'll explain exactly why. And you'll say, I know exactly what you're talking about. This has happened to me because it's happened to everybody. It's happened to me and it's happened to everybody that I've talked to. And this experience is one where you are working on a mix and you're sort of tirelessly working on a mix. And you kind of get it, like everything is just rocking. You're so excited about it. You listen to it. You're happy with it. It's like, oh, this sounds good. Got the low end exactly the way I want. High frequencies, whatever, you know, all good. All this, like, got my reverbs exactly the way I want. And then you come back the next day and you're like, oh, my God, this sounds like hell. What happened? And and maybe, you know, the experience is some variation of that. Maybe you didn't feel that great about it, but you thought it was much better. And you come back and you listen, it's like everything is bright and shrill or everything is dark and dull. And what happened was that your brain's internal dynamic EQ was saying, you know what, I don't hear that vocal as clearly, so I'm going to make myself more sensitive maybe to 2 to 6K. And so it becomes more sensitive to those frequencies. And then, so during that time, if you're not taking any breaks, if you're not giving yourself any perspective change during that period of time, and you're listening basically the same way, same speaker is in the same space for a long period of time, you'll end up with some dynamic equalization circuit that's built in that's actually kind of messing with you. So you come in the next day, now your hearing curve doesn't have that 2 to K, 6K cut or boost or whatever, and now you listen and everything sounds dull and dark. Because the frequencies that that balances off with in the low mids now all of a sudden are really exaggerated. So in working with this, you have to understand that you are a dynamic living being. Um, making final mix decisions after eating a big bowl of ice cream is generally not a good idea. 
Um, you know, so there are things in terms of your diet, not saying like, okay, you got to be a vegan to be a good mix engineer. It's not about that. It's about, um, saying that, you know, if you're going to eat, know that there's a period of time where, um, you know, things are, are, you know, adjusting constantly and your brain is constantly adapting to the environment. So what are the ways that you can best deal with things? Um, Whenever possible, listen at low monitoring volumes. When you listen at low monitoring volumes, right, and when you listen at low levels, what ends up happening is that um, there's some amazing things about it. One is, is that when you listen at low levels, your sensitivity becomes extremely heightened. Um, your brain becomes much more sensitive to the nuances and differences in sound. I sometimes like smaller speaker systems as a result that are supplemented by subwoofers because what ends up happening is that every speaker system has an efficiency range. Um, and it may be worth having a second pair of monitors that are smaller that you listen to at lower volumes. In other words, the efficiency range is not so much in the high frequency driver, but the low frequency driver. In other words, if you have a, a 10 inch driver on the low end, you're gonna have to push a certain amount of, of SPL in order for that driver to operate in an efficient area. So in other words, if you feed a certain amount of voltage into a low frequency driver, uh, there is going to be, and let's just say like this is the low voltage area, this is like the high voltage area. And so on this end, you're getting inefficiency because the amount of energy is not translating as efficiently to the speaker driver. So the magnetic field that's created doesn't push the voice coil as well. So now the responsiveness of the driver is not so good. So that's a bad area. And then you got an efficiency area where the driver has enough energy that it's operating as uh, as spec'd out in the system. And then you reach uh, a point on the top end where you're pushing more energy that it's capable of handling. So the driver itself is pushing um, out to an end where it starts to become more and more resistant and you start to get driver compression characteristics on this end. So you have a bad area. So somewhere in here, the bigger the monitor, the bigger the speaker, the more power it takes to move that energy efficiently. And so as a result, what ends up happening in there is that if you're not in the efficiency range of your speaker, then you're not getting accurate monitoring. So if you have a bigger set of monitors in a bigger control room, you need to have a smaller pair of monitors that you can work with in, at lower listening volumes that's very accurate. This is like so powerful to me that really functionally the way that I work is almost listening at low volumes all the time. I balanced out and tuned my room with my whipper in uh, low end and uh, top end and, uh, and mid levels all at lower levels, closer to, you know, probably, I didn't set it to a specific DBSPL level. I just kind of balanced it out. It like, this feels good to me. Uh, it ends up being somewhere in the 68 DBSPL range, 70 DBSPL range, somewhere in there. Um, a very low level um, by comparison to 85. And if you think like, oh, that's not really that big of a difference. It's like, well, you know, when you start going that, if, you know, if a 3 dB difference or a, uh, um, uh, is you know twice as much or half as much then that's it i believe actually spl is a power thing so that's that's uh, uh 60 b is twice as much or half as much I, I can't remember off the top of my head with that particular spl scale but uh it's a big difference in terms of listening volume so that's that's important and uh so you can balance things out like that so the important thing here in having multiple monitors which is an, a new one so if you have uh, multiple sets of monitors then what happens is is that um you can um you can switch back and forth because each will have its different tonal characteristics to it and therefore when you go back and forth what you'll find is that um you know if you're used to listening on speakers like in your your kind of you'll be able to tell instantly how much your brain is morphed because as soon as you switch to the other speakers it'll sound oh like oh no the bass disappeared you know the vocals way too loud you know this is a problem that's a problem it's like this sounds hideous uh and then you know you work on those for a while and it's like oh it's sounding good now and then you switch back and it's like ah oh. so the more you switch back and forth uh, becomes important because your brain is now actively responding to what it's listening to. So before it, because there's a delay, it's your brain doesn't respond instantly because there's no danger here. It's just trying to make more intelligible what's going on. So if you listen at lower volumes, it becomes more sensitive and more accurate. 
I found this to be true in every case. In fact, almost all automation that I've done, once I've gotten levels basically good, is I do it at very low listening volumes. And it's incredible. Like you just, you move the fader, you practically breathe on the fader, like the amount that you move it and you hear the difference so dramatically at lower listening levels. So it's it's pretty crazy. Um, the other thing is taking breaks and taking regular breaks. So in addition to this, uh, it's taking a breather. You know, um, I said this rule once and I'll explain a little bit about this because it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, it's something that kind of happened by accident. Let's just put it that way. And, and, uh, um, but I ended up working, uh, assisting, uh, um, years prior to this particular time when I finally decided to act on it. I had worked with this one engineer who monitored at very low listening volumes. In fact, it was almost so painfully low that I was literally, it's like I took off my shoes and I was walking around in socks in the control room, basically like walking slowly because the just, just the shuffling sound of my socks on the rug was, was just like bludgeoning the volume of the speakers. He was listening so low. And the guy had a timer, a little egg timer, and every 45 minutes it'd go ding, and he'd, and he'd leave the room, and he'd go take a break, and he'd go off in the back, or he'd go up, you know, to the, uh, you know, um, get a cup of coffee, or he would walk out of the studio for a little bit, or he'd sit in the lounge and, you know, read a magazine, and then he would come back in, and he would continue working, and he fi finished his mixes very efficiently, very fast, and when we turned volumes up higher, they sounded amazing. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Um... And um, so uh, I never really got a full explanation because he was, uh, English was a second language to him and his English was not very good. So his explaining what was going on was difficult, but I caught the basic concept. And um, it's really, 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 you know, um, a powerful way to work. So later on, years later, I'm in uh, Whitney's studio. Uh, she had two studios, a commercial studio and a private studio. A private studio was like a world-class facility. The commercial studio was maybe a class B-plus kind of studio, basically. But had an SSL. Uh, I did a lot of mixing work. I knew the the faults of the room was very well equipped because uh, I helped, um, you know, decide what gear was in there and, and all that sort of stuff and knew how to work the rooms and stuff. So I did a lot of work there. Got the rooms really cheap, which was also helpful. And I was in there mixing... And I was doing, um, uh, I was working with this record label and they were just feeding me singles. And it was literally like every day, like six days a week, I'm getting a new song to work on and I'm pumping out a song a day and I'm just knocking them off one after the other. And they just keep feeding me work. And this was going on for a couple of months. And when that type of situation happens, one, you're just enormously happy because you're just raking in the dough and, uh, you know, which is cool, you know, so you're, you're uh, at that point, you know, uh, things are going well financially. But what was more important to me was that I wanted to try this where I felt like I, when I was mixing, if I tried something, it didn't work, tried something else, it didn't work, tried a third thing, it didn't work, I would undo those three things and I would leave the room. I would just like, as soon as like I started to do something and it's like the solutions or what I was thinking was the solutions was um, um, like... Um, not working like the things that I was coming up with. It's like, oh, I think there's something about them like trying these things with the bass and it's not changing the problem. I would leave the room, walk out of the room. I would go, you know, hang out with the manager or whatever friends I had at the studio, take a walk outside, you know, hang out, you know, um, you know, get something to drink or whatever. And, uh, and so then I would, you know, a couple tequila shots, <laughs> whatever was hanging around the studio, go back in the room. And then I uh, hit play on the tape and almost always after taking like even like a five minute break, I would hit play and it's like, oh, the problem is with the kick drum. Oh, the problem is with this like room. Like I would hear what the problem was right away. I'd fix the problem and then I would continue mixing. It would be like, boom, like instant solution. And what I have found was that the more you work when you start, you, you have a certain amount of time where you think clearly and then maybe you become so hyper-focused on a particular thing that you lose perspective on the mix. And so what ends up happening is that you hear a problem and it's like, oh, there's a problem outside this area that I'm so focused in on. It must be that damn base, you know, because I had a problem with that before. And then you start, you step out of that world and you kind of start doing other things. And then all of a sudden... It's like, oh, okay, maybe that's a little bit better, but it's not really right. And then you keep mixing and then you start piling on problems on top of problems. So then the so the thing is, is then take 
you know, taking the break, just that little bit of perspective allows me to clear my head. So now when I come in, I'm not so zoomed in instantly when I listen. I've actually given my brain something else to think about, whatever it is, so that when I walk back into the space and I hit play and, um, uh, you know, go back to it, I would hear what the issue was right away. So the breaks are a really powerful way of kind of, you know, taking it up. And you'd be amazed, like, just to put it this way. Normally, for most 48-track mixes, which was what I was doing for this project, it would be like one 48-track record after another. It would be typically would take me about 12 hours, 12 to 15 hours to do a complete mix that would be finalized for the day, and you would have that one day to do it. When I changed over to this system and this way of working, those same mixes that took me 12 to 15 hours were now taking me 8 to 12 hours or 8 to 10 hours each. And um, because I wasn't making mistakes as I was going along, you know, or I would like, when I realized something, it's like, okay, I'm not hearing well, I'll take a little break, come back in. It's like, oh, I hear the problem right away. Now I continue on to the next thing. I was working more efficiently. Um, and that's that becomes a really important thing. So this thing is an important concept because it's a major, major, major trap. And you would only know this if it was something that you were doing every day, all the time, nonstop, you would have this experience. And even then, People would continue to, to exhibit very poor behaviors for years before really changing their habits. Like so many engineers that were making, you know, that I assisted for, that were making records nonstop one after the other would just listen at, you know, piercingly loud volumes like all the time. And they would just continue to get records and they would, you know, make really good records. And it was just like, man, this is just, it's unbelievable. How do you do that? Um, everybody's different. Um, but you need to be conscious and aware of this and breaks is one of the, the way to do it. So, uh, those are three basic ways that you can help to manage those situations. Um, and just the real takeaway from this is that you understand that, um, uh, there is going to be some, some issues that will come up regarding this and you know I just, I just want you to be you know very very aware of it now there's one other level of this that i want to get into and this is into using reference mixes reference mixes are also a very powerful way of um of making um helping to kind of keep you on the the straight and narrow um what a reference mix is is uh it's a commercially released professional um record that you like the sound up that's well mixed and it's perhaps the direction that you're going with the band now i could make this a whole separate lesson here um and there's a whole art to it i've even considered making a course that's just on mix mapping you know uh doing something on this and and how to analyze mixes and work with mixes and and do all of that and work with reference mixes because it's very important um the idea of a reference mix is that it defines a direction um but when you go about working with reference mixes, the objective is not to match the frequency response and sort of cookie cutter your production the same way. So in other words, getting the exact same snare sound that they had on that particular record is an insane idea and, and will ultimately lead to your destruction. Um, it's never It never works effectively in any way that I've ever found. But what it does is it acts as a reference point. What you want to do is you want to match the intensity and the aliveness and the vibrancy of the production. So when they're played side by side, you say, man, okay, this, this song feels just as intense and exciting as the reference song. Like my mix feels as exciting as what I'm going on. And that's kind of what you're matching. So maybe I need a little bit more low end in my mix to drive it. Maybe my drum sound or snare sound needs to be a little bit fatter or, or brighter than the one that's on the other because that's more appropriate to the song and the recording and the instruments that I'm working with. Um, but it's the intensity that you're going for. The other part of the reference mix and having something else in the background is it's a way of correcting the temporary threshold shift that is occurring through your listening and monitoring. It's a way of saying, you know, at some point it's like, man, this sounds really so amazing with all this top end. And then you switch over to the reference mix and it sounds by comparison to what you were doing, right? It sounds very muffled. And you realize it's like, okay, that's way over the top because I know this reference mix is really, is pretty bright. 
And if I'm that bright, then I'm like screeching, you know, um, fingernails on a chalkboard uh, kind of thing going on. So you want to be very careful about that. So the reference mixes are, are um, important. Now, I had one other segment, and I'm going to divide this out into... Um, into a separate thing, and it's going to be uh, on uh, mix mapping. And uh, so uh, I'm going to place this um, into uh, a separate segment. And uh, uh, that was my, my one other note that I wanted to go over here, but I think it's it's more deserving of something else. And I'll kind of get to this at the uh, as we kind of get uh, a little bit farther down the line here. So. Uh, with that note, um, that, I think that covers the basics of what I wanted to do here. So for lesson number seven uh, in the premix preparation, uh, uh, monitoring and self-calibration.